Welcome back. I'm Deanne Erdman with Baylor College of Medicine's Options Program. And we're in the process of reviewing for the Life Science um, Teacher Certification Exam. Continuing with Domain 4, the diversity of life, we're going to look at a big section today, and that's Part B, the Survey of the Kingdoms. Uh, I want you to keep in mind while we're doing this that our task is, is to refresh your memory and to em embed some pedagogy as we go along. If you need some more in-depth information, you can find that within the website. Okay, taking a look at our first slide, we're looking at the phylogenetic kingdoms, and you'll notice that I'm using a traditional five-kingdom approach. In the previous section on classification, you can recall that we talked about classi a classification, we talked about domains, we talked about a five-kingdom system, a six-kingdom system, and even more. And just for clarity, we're going to stick with the five kingdoms uh, classifications uh, today, and I think that that will um, serve our purpose as well. Anytime you're looking at a chart like this, instead of just reading it off to students, you want to go through and show part of your, your thought process in creating something like this. And as we look, you'll see that we're looking at cell structure, we're looking at cell type, and we're looking at nutrition. Uh, we've got the monerans, the protists, the fungi, the plants, and the animals. And the first thing that I notice in looking at this chart is that the monerans are the only ones that are prokaryotes. Everything else is a eukaryote, so that's one of our first big divisions. In, within the monerans, we have eubacteria and archaeobacteria, and we look at those and divide those, first of all, by whether they have the presence or absence of peptidoglycan in their cell walls. And we're going to investigate that and... and uh, explore that a little further later on. Let's skip over the protists for a minute and go to fungi. And when we look at the fungi, you see that they are multicellular, uh, except for the yeast. And don't overlook the yeast because that's a very big group uh, of organisms. They don't move. They're heterotrophic. And of course, we're talking about decomposers in the case of fungi. And they have chitin in their cell walls. And I want you to kind of think and stretch back in your memory and think about where else you've run across chi uh, chitin within the world of organisms. And it's kind of an unusual uh, thing to find it in the cell wall of the fungi. So it's, it's a very defining characteristic. Take a look at plants. Um, how are they different? They're multicellular again. They are non-modal. And when you look at those characteristics and compare with fungi, you can see why fungi were in the plant kingdom for a while. But the plants are autotrophic, and their cell wall contains cellulose, so there's some big differences. When we look at animals, uh, again, eukaryotes, again, multicellular, but now an another difference, they're motile. They can move at some time in their life, and they're heterotrophic and no cell wall. Now, that takes us back to protists. And why did I skip them in the beginning? Well, you start looking. It's kind of a catch-all category. Uh, they're eukaryotes, but basically, uh, from that point on, it's, it's anything that's not a fungus, not a plant, and not an animal. And it's pretty exciting uh, working with this group right now because of all of the new molecular data that, that's coming in. Uh, we're really beginning to unravel some of the mysteries of this big group, so I don't think you'll see it, them all lumped together for very much longer. When we looked at that, that chart, viruses weren't anywhere in the pictures. So where do they fit in? Uh, they don't meet our characteristics of what we call alive. And this is a great point to, time to go back and think about the characteristics of life. And you would have done this with your students pretty early on in the year. Um, one of the activities I might have done with them was to, was to place a lot of things around the room, from living plants to maybe something inactive like yeast, uh, a fan that's turned on and moving, a candle that's burning. Ask them to develop their own chart about how they're going to decide whether something's alive or not, and then go around and um, make a decision. And so you can recall that information. And it's, it's really important to continue to do this throughout your teaching because you'll be surprised sometimes how, how kids' perception of something that you taught, that you thought they had so well changed. It changes, and it gives you a chance to correct those inaccuracies. Plus, it gives you a chance to make some new connections. And the more connections you make, the longer they're going to put it uh, into their long-term memory. And it's going to become something that they understand versus something that they memorize. So when we're looking at viruses and we start going back through all those characteristics of life, we see that 
um, they're, they're first of all they're not a, they're not even a cell. Um, they they do have nucleic acids, but in most cases just DNA or RNA, and that's very different from all of our living organisms. They have a protein shell, not a cell wall. Uh, that protein s shell is called a capsid, and they have some uh, pretty interesting shapes, uh, usually a polyhedron or a helix, and they can be crystallized. So uh, very unusual group. They don't grow. They don't maintain homeostasis. They don't metabolize on their own. Um, and in fact, in order to replicate, they have to be in a host cell. So if they are alive, if you want to stretch that point, I guess it would be about the most uh, extreme form of a parasite that you could even imagine. If we take a look at the uh, lytic and the lysogenic life cycles of, of viruses, it lets you kind of have a clue on, on how clever these little uh, uh, quote unquote organisms are at being able to adapt. And the first thing that the virus does is it, is it attaches to a cell, and it's a specific cell, and it's recognizing uh, a receptor site on the outside of a cell. And the first thing that should come to your mind is why would a cell have a receptor site to receive a virus? Well, it doesn't. Uh, take your students back to the point where we were looking at uh, cell membranes, cell transport, uh, receptor proteins. Um, all of those kinds of things and talk about why they're there and what they're there for and that the viruses have made an adaptation where that they can use this to gain entry in the cell. It's sort of like uh, they've got the secret password. So they attach to the cell, they inject their DNA or their RNA and that takes over the host cell's machinery and the, the cell now starts to, uh, to be a virus producing machine. It produces uh, additional protective coatings, it produces the nucleic acid, it assembles them, and then the cell lyses and releases everything. Let's look at the other cycle, the lysogenic cycle. This one, the, the virus inserts itself, but it just inserts itself into the genome of the, of the uh, host cell and it uh, remains inactive. And so as the uh, host cell goes about its business of doing normal things like um, reproducing, it reproduces that viral DNA along with it. And the repercussions of this are pretty uh, easy to see that uh, if this virus becomes, decides to become active or go into a lytic cycle, now you have many more cells that are, are involved and effective and the potential harm to the organism can be much greater. Viruses cause a lot of plant and animal diseases. We have small, we even have small pieces of viruses. If viruses weren't enough problem, we have prions and viroids. And the viroids are involved in uh, primarily plant diseases and the prions are involved in um, uh, diseases or disorders that affect animals. Uh, some examples of viral infections, of course, smallpox, uh, which has been in the news lately, chickenpox, herpes, HIV. Let's take a look at, at the kingdom Monera, if we're going to call it a kingdom. And uh, we're going to look at the eubacteria first. And generally, this group is the most numerous group, so we just refer to this group as the bacteria. And remembering back, they're unicellular, they've got prokaryote, uh, they're prokaryote cell. They do not have introns in their, their genome, which is something very different from eukaryote cells. <clears throat> they have peptidoglycan in their cell wall. And remember, uh, the presence or absence of that peptidoglycan is one of the things that you use in identifying bacteria with the gram staining technique, gram, gram positive, gram negative. And this is an easy technique that you can use with your, your students. It's one of the things um, that the options program is aimed at is, is because uh, a lot of you guys that are looking to become teachers also have really strong research skills and we want to see that in the classroom because it's really a useful tool uh, with students and, and the pro and you can find most of the equipment and do this process pretty easily with them. Another identifying mark with the bacteria are their shape and you remember the coxae which are the sphere shape, the bacilla which are the rod shape and it, to further identify them, they, they have little patterns. Some of them uh, like to pair up. Some of them want to be in clusters, a little disorganized. Some of them want to be in tetrads. So that's an identifying mark. And the spirilla, which is a corkscrew shape. Many are modal. They can move with flagella. Uh, some of them can move with a corkscrew uh, of fashion. Some of them slide on a layer of, of a slime. 
when I'm thinking about bacteria, they uh, they were here long before us, and and the way it looks, it's, it's looking like they'll be here long after us as well. And you start to, to look around at where they are. They are everywhere. They're on the surface of organisms. They're inside organisms. They are um, in, in very cold, harsh environments, in hot environments, uh, wet, dry, you name it, bacteria are there. So in order to, to fit into all of those, they've got to have some very unique abilities to adapt. And as we take a look at, um, first of all, nutrition, B bacteria have some very ingenious ways of obtaining their nourishment. Very traditional photoautotrophic. Some can be chemoautotrophic, photoheterotrophic, and even chemoheterotrophic. So I guess they've cornered the, the market on, uh, on complicated jargon just as well. And then for respiration, um, many traditional bacteria are aerobic the, the, uh, and use oxygen, but some really prefer to live in an anaerobic condition and there are still others that are actually poisoned by oxygen and have to live in a totally anaerobic uh, condition. Now we're going to look at reproduction, still another thing that adds to their versatility. Uh, the easiest way that with the least amount of energy for an organism to reproduce is just plain old binary fission. We know that sexual reproduction evolved because it, it causes increases in the genome and new possibilities for organisms to adapt. And the bacteria have uh, come up with some very unusual ways in order to alter their genome. Certainly, uh, just like every other organism, they can, can count on mutations, some of which don't cause any harm, some of which are detrimental, some of which are great uh, for the bacteria. And they also can uh, exchange DNA material with themselves, with each other, and a process called conjugation. They additionally can absorb DNA from uh, dead or decaying material, and they can even um, rely on viruses as they're invading. Sometimes viruses, as they uh, invade a bacteria, don't cause any harm at all, but they also bring along little snippets of DNA from other organisms. So when you look at all of these ways that bacteria can uh, can add on and uh, reproduce and change their alter their DNA you look at the variety of nutrition and uh, respiration within the bacteria and then you add the speed at which they can reproduce sometimes as quick as 20 minutes you begin to see why <clears throat> they are so adaptable I can't help but laugh sometimes when I think about reproduction in, in bacteria and I think about a cartoonist like Gary Larson um, and biology teachers, of course, love Gary Larson because he, he is a biologist. He draws on actual uh, and very factual content and to poke fun and, and to come up with some really clever and unique cartoons. And I know I've seen a number that go along with the reproduction in bacteria. So you might take a look for some of those. The kingdom Monera uh, also has a group of archaeobacteria. And in this group, they do not have the peptidoglycan in their cell in their cell wall. The the membrane also uh, contains some unusual lipids that we don't find in other organisms. And so this is a, a, an area that's uh, received a lot of intense research lately. Genes are interrupted by interons, and so that's different from the U bacteria. And they're classified into three groups. And when you look at these three groups, you can kind of call them. Um, the extremophiles, because they really like the extreme conditions. They found their own little special place to be able to thrive. And the methanogens are actually, po they're anaerobic, they're actually poisoned by oxygen, and they make methane. The uh, thermophiles, and of course therma heat, uh, feel loving, and that, that too is a good thing to do with your students. Break apart words, use those derivatives <clears throat> to teach them to be able to figure out things for themselves so that they're not memorizing definitions, but instead they are um, uh, already know what, what the term means. But the thermophiles, we can find those in the hot springs um, around Yellowstone. We can find them in the deep hydro, uh, thermal, thermal vents in, in the deep oceans. Haleophiles can tolerate in, incredible amounts of salt. Uh, you find them in, uh, for example, the Great Salt Lake. Okay, let's take a look at the ecological importance of prokaryotes. And, and the first thing that I, that kind of comes to my mind is, wow, when you've got a group that you find everywhere, inside, outside, and they, they are so diverse, you know that they're going to have a big impact on us. 
And I've often asked students to start listing things about bacteria and to tell me uh, why they're important. And the, the list is, is long with all of the di disease-causing bacteria. But it's important for, for them to realize that there are really a pretty small number of bacteria out there that are the pathogenic uh, form and how important bacteria are and how instrumental they are uh, to life on Earth. Uh, think about the, the Earth as a spaceship. Yes, we have a continual um, uh, stream of sunlight coming in and energy in, in the form of energy, but all the other nutrients and all the other things on Earth, they're finite. They, we don't have any more. We have to recycle those. Uh, I compare it with a can of Legos. When I dig out my can of Legos and I make my little uh, castle and I make my airplane and I make my little choo-choo train, then pretty soon I look in my Legos and there's, there's none left. I've got to break them apart if I'm going to continue to make things. And the same thing is true uh, of the earth. And bacteria are very instrumental in that decomposition process. Think about everything that's ever lived. And if it, if it died and wasn't decomposed, not only would it be a big eyesore and a lot of trouble to tramp through all of that, but we wouldn't have any more nutrients. We wouldn't have any more building supplies to, uh, to, to keep going with new organisms. Bacteria have a, a very unique ability to fix nitrogen. <clears throat> As we're sitting here, we're breathing in and out about 79% of nitrogen. We can do absolutely nothing with it. Yet nitrogen is a real important part of our bodies. It's an important component of proteins. So we rely on organisms like the bacteria to be able to, to convert that atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form for different kinds of organisms. Once again, here's another tie. You would have already covered the biogeochemical cycles. This is another time to revisit it and talk about the uh, importance of, uh, of the nitrogen cycle and the role that bacteria are playing in it. Bacteria form a lot of mutualistic relationships. And if you remember the term mutualism, it's a form of symbiosis. And in symbiosis, you're looking uh, for a, a long-term close association of organisms. And in a mutualistic relationship, both are benefiting. Um, in all symbiotic relationships, at least one organism benefits. And in the case of mutualism, both benefit. And with bacteria, we have uh, bacteria that inhabit our large in our intestines, and they produce vitamins for us, vitamin K specifically. Some bacteria are able to alter the pH and prevent fungus from growing so that we don't get more fungal infections. Um, parasitic relationships. Pas uh, Louis Pasteur, of course, was the first one to actually um, link bacteria to disease. But Robert Koch uh, actually isolated the first organisms specifically, uh, naming them as causing certain diseases. And of course, those were anthrax and tuberculosis. And uh, Koch's postulates are still used in modern uh, microbiology techniques today. Uh, some examples of parasitic bacteria uh, or diseases that they cause, tetanus. Uh, and we've all had that tetanus booster, of course. Diphtheria, botulism, Lyme's disease, um, some pneumonias, cholera. That just names a few. There's a, there's a big list. And uh, uh, along with the parasitic organisms of uh, bacteria, and even later after you've covered protists, uh, I've, I've done an activity called a dreaded disease. And as the students come in that day, I have a lot of diseases uh, cut up onto little pieces of paper and they draw out of a basket, and that's, that's their disease they've been infected with. And they have to do some research on it. And with the Internet available, we really just have unlimited resources to be able to do unique pro uh, projects like that. Industrial uses of bacteria, uh, the fermentation process we use to make a lot of foods, buttermilk, cheese, vinegar, olives, uh, bacteria used in uh, uh, bioremediation to help clean up oil spills. Uh, they are even used in mining, and uh, it's kind of a, a unique um, group of the bacteria that are able to actually s uh, separate out some of the, sulf uh, some of the uh, metal sulf uh, sulfides, like copper and, and gold, and be able to release those uh, ores for um, our use. So you, you never know what kind of surprising thing you might find uh, the bacteria involved in. Uh, with medicine, uh, the bacteria have been used in bioengineering, to insert uh, human genes for insulin. And uh, 
the, the, the best thing about that for diabetics is that the insulin that they're producing is from a human gene. So it's human insulin, and uh, as opposed to insulin that's produced in other kinds of organisms. Uh, so, that, so bacteria are, have, have a lot of tremendous uses. I want to encourage you, and the bacteria are really rich with this, to go to, to look back at the content standards, uh, interdependence of organisms, recognition patterns, um, how they evolve. You have lots and lots of, of, of rich connections that you can make with this uh, with this group. The infamous Protus king, uh, Kingdom, and uh, of course this is a, a big classification problem. But we are hot on the trail of these protists and working with them with molecular analysis. But for now, uh, they're lumped together, so you see a real diversity, unicellular, colonial, multicellular forms. Some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic, some move with flagella, some with pseudopods, some with cilia, some not at all. And when we're looking at these, uh, uh, this particular group, we pretty much break them down into the animal-like, plant-like, and fungus-like groups. The animal-like, uh, many times are referred to as protozoans, which means first animal, so you can pretty much guess where they used to be classified. They are classified by their movement, and uh, you know, prime examples of protozoans are the paramecium uh, and the amoeba. Those are our big representatives of that particular group. In the plant-like group, we uh, often call these or refer to these as the algae, and they range from unicellular chlamydomonas clear up to the giant kelp, which can reach uh, lengths of, uh, or heights of 60 meters, and they even have to have air bladders to help uh, suspend them in the water. Uh, I've been to California before and, and seen the big mowing machines that float like barges and go across uh, and harvest the kelp because uh, so many of the products are used um, in, 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 in making of our foods. Our fungus-like group, uh, an example that I can think of it, it, with the, this particular um, group of organisms is a water mold. And the water mold um, actually was responsible for causing the great potato famine in the 1840s in Ireland. And this water mold, what it does is it, it gets into and embeds itself in the leaf of the potato plant, destroys the plant. <clears throat> it caused such widespread famine in, in Ireland that and many um, uh, Irish immigrated to the United States, and so that was some of the beginning of our big Irish population. Protists are able to reproduce by both mitosis and meiosis. <coughs> the ecological importance of protists, they're, they're, of course, a big foundation of our food chain, and they are one of the the uh, prime components of what we call the phytoplankton that float in the ocean. It's, it, they produce a tremendous amount of our oxygen as well. It's, it's real easy to overlook little one-celled organisms and think of them not being very important, but they actually produce over 50% of the world's oxygen. And so care of our, uh, care of our oceans and it, introducing that to students and that they're not limitless and they, they, they do have an impact on, on us and they are important. Uh, is a good and a, and a, and a very important uh, concept. You have to remember that when you are teaching uh, biology in high school, especially ninth and 10th grade, that there are a lot of those students that, that aren't gonna take biology again. They may not even go to college. And so this is our last shot at them. So we wanna make sure we do a good job, that we're good stewards of, uh, of, of giving them some practical information about applying biology. After all, you're a living organism in a living world, you need to understand a little bit about it. The protists are also important in decomposition, and you can uh, pull back again to your discussion of bacteria. Don't miss opportunities to weave in learning as you go. The protists are involved in a lot of symbiotic relationships. Um, some of the mutualistic relationships that I can give you an example of might be euglena, and euglena are used in sewage treatment plants. And what they do is they can switch between an autotrophic and a heterotrophic mode. So they begin to uh, decompose the sewage um, uh, heterotrophically. And as they do, they consume all of the oxygen in the water. So then they can just um, move into an autotrophic mode and, and produce oxygen. And that helps um, keep the cycle going and the sewage gets uh, de uh, decomposed the way it should be. Trichonympha is a, is a little protozoan that lives in the gut of the termite. Termite can't digest wood any better than we can, 
But this trichonympha produces an enzyme, cellulase, which helps uh, the termite to be able to digest the wood. In turn, the trichonympha is getting lots of food and a great place to be protected. Parasitic uh, examples, uh, African sleeping sickness is a very traditional um, example that you, that you see. And of course, African sleeping sickness and malaria are really caused by protists, but they're transmitted by arthropods, the African sleeping sickness with the tsetse fly and malaria with the mosquito. And it's good to correct the misconception that it's the arthropod or the insect that's transmitting the disease. It's really a protozoan, and they have very complicated life cycles. Uh, amoebic dysentery, of course, is another um, cause of, of disease from this particular group. Medicinal and, in, and industrial uses. Uh, medications have been uh, created from compounds from protists that help treat ulcers, they help treat blood pressure, and help treat arthritis, just to name a few. We have a lot of products that, that come from algae. Uh, the diatomaceous earth that's in a swimming pool filter uh, comes from the shells of, of diatoms, uh, which are in the same group as amoeba. It's kind of hard to think of something with a shell related to an amoeba but they, they have the pseudopods that they stick through their, um, uh, through the little uh, openings in the shell. They're used in fine polishes. Uh, some protists are used in uh, making of waxes and plastics. Uh, many protists are bioluminescence. They are able to, to convert uh, light energy to chemical energy. And that luminescent ability uh, gives them some reflective um, properties that are used in some of our paints. Uh, some uh, uh, protists are also used in the production of lubricants. So, and the list goes on and on, and, and, and that's another place that you can spark students' interest who are interested in this to see what other kinds of things that they can come up with. Uh, <clears throat> I've often done a project called Have You Eaten Algae Today? And I've given them some products that um, uh, can be found on food labels that are made from algae and had them go about their day and, and just see if they can collect, how many labels they can collect that have algae in them. And I, I give them some samples and a lot of times they're pretty surprised. The fungus. Um, some examples to start out with. Mushrooms, ev almost everybody if you talk about a fungus will talk about mushrooms. Uh, and even something as good at, to, and, and yummy to eat as the portobello mushrooms, but and truffles, uh, not the Godiva kind that I like, but uh, an even more expensive uh, version that um, pigs are used to help sniff out, moles, mildew, uh, bracket fungi. Those are all kind of some examples in that group, and it's a good idea to kind of get people thinking about and visualizing what you're talking about before you just start jumping into uh, kind of obscure characteristics. They're eukaryotes. They have chitin in their cell walls. And earlier, I asked you to, to think about um, where else you run across chitin in the world of organisms, and I don't know what you came up with, but you find chitin in the exoskeletons of arthropods. And so uh, that's kind of a, an interesting link because fungi don't seem like they have anything at all in common with those organisms. All of the fungus are multicellular with the, with the exception of yeast. And as I said earlier, don't discount the yeast because they are uh, a very large group and there's a, there's a large number of species of them. They are heterotrophic, uh, primarily decomposers, and their body of, of the fungus is really probably quite different than, than you might think of. It's really composed of long, slender, little tube-like threads that for the most part you don't see. When you look out on your lawn and you see um, a lot of uh, toadstools or mushrooms popping up, you're really just seeing those showy reproductive structures. And if you went under the mat of grass, you would see something that almost looked like crushed spider webs. And that's mycelium or a mass of hyphae. And that's the true body of, of the fungus. And uh, the, uh, the showy uh, mushroom is just there temporarily and it's just to put out the spores. Um, think about the pattern that you see. You notice that uh, it, it, almost makes a, 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 it almost makes a circle. And uh, sometimes we refer to this as a fairy ring. And, it, and you might ask, uh, it's always good to get kids to think about why it looks like that. Well, as the fungus is decomposing uh, things in its center, it's moving further and further out. And so it makes uh, good sense to put its reproductive structures up uh, at the outer edge of where the fungus is actually living so they can spread its, uh, its spores a little bit further. Ecological importance of fungus. Um, 
again, they're, they're decomposers. And without the protists and without the bacteria, we'd be in, in big trouble without this decomposition process. As far as symbiotic relationships, um, parasitic uh, ones that I can think of with plants, ask, you, ask your students if, if they've heard their parents talking about problems with their yard. They're talking about brown, uh, brown spot or brown patch. They're talking about black spot. They're talking about mildew maybe on their, on their crepe myrtles. All of those are caused by, by fungus. Uh, with animals um, or with ourselves, for example, you may have um, had the unfortunate or, or unpleasant experience of having athlete's foot or ringworm. Those are caused by fungus. And uh, it, there's a lot of uh, girls out there now that like to go to nail shops and sometimes they end up getting a fungal infection under their nails. And one of the things that people discover is that fungal infections in many cases are much harder to get rid of than our bacterial infections. And one of the reasons for that might lie in the fact that of the, of the basic cellular structure. We, we can go after the bacteria a little bit more aggressively because they're a totally different kind of cell than we are. But fungus uh, are made of eukaryote cells and so are we. And uh, that's w just one of the many reasons why they're pretty difficult infections to get rid of. When you're looking at some mutualistic relationships with uh, the fungus, lichens, and they're just one of my favorite things to bring into the class because they're a symbiotic re, uh, relationship between a, a fungus and either a cyanobacteria uh, or, a, or an algae. And the algae uh, or the cyanobacteria is getting protection, it's getting moisture, and the fungus is getting uh, food materials from the photosynthetic activity of the other organism. And they come in sort of a crusty form, uh, a shrub form, a tree-like form. And I really like to introduce techniques with a dissecting microscope using these. And, and the, the kids get a, a, a real charge out of looking at these and seeing the structures under that uh, stereo microscope. So it, it, it's a good place to practice and exercise that skill. Uh, mycorrhizae are another uh, mutualistic relationship of uh, fungus form with plants. And in this case, the hyphae of, of this particular fungus forms on the ends of roots. So what it does is it, it, it's like making more root hairs for the plants. And what's important about that? Well, think about the plants and what it's doing with its roots. It's absorbing water and minerals and it's anchoring. So those mycosary uh, are really important in helping uh, that plant. Orchids, for example, have a big relationship with this particular group. One thing, when you're working with, uh, with the fungus, they're a lot of fun. Um, you can have students bring in samples of them. You can do mold um, prints with, uh, or spore prints with different mushrooms, but you want to be particularly sensitive to students that might be allergic. And uh, again, this is a place that I can talk to you about a teacher's kind of got to wear a lot of hats. And at the beginning of school, you should have uh, had all your students sign a, a, a safety form. And that should be signed by their parents. And on that form, there should be a place for special consideration, special allergies. Occasionally, you, you know, everybody maybe reacts a little bit to these things, but occasionally you'll have students that this really sets off and bothers. And you're going to want to take some special precautions about those kind of things and keep that in mind when you're dealing with live organisms. The Kingdom Plantae. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a really fun group. Kids like to do this because uh, it's a time to go outside. Um, when you first just start talking about plants or botany, they may uh, kind of uh, get a sour face, but I think you can turn it into where they realize how important plants are and, and how much maybe they're going to enjoy them um, later on. They're multicellular. They can't move. They have a cell wall with cellulose. And of course, they're primarily autotrophic. Plant life cycles, uh, you need to have a discussion uh, about the difference between sporophyte and the gametophyte generation uh, with plant structures. Uh, and when I think of plant structures, I'm thinking of things in terms of vascular tissue like xylem and phloem, roots, stems, leaves, pollen, flowers, seeds, all of those kinds of things. And for this uh, certification exam, I, I really do not get the idea or the impression that you need to be able to give a dissertation on all of these different plant structures. But I certainly, if, if I feel a little rusty, would go back and review those structures, 
just for their general functioning. Um, for for a, a question or something that I've I've done with with plant structures, looking at a plant leaf, and uh, you can put something as simple as an Eladea um, leaf. It's a water plant on a microscope slide, and under the proper conditions, you can see the chloroplast streaming in that leaf. And I have seen questions on um, you know you can standardized tests where they ask about you know, what the purpose of that is or what uh, uh, the chloroplast moving within the leaf. And it's, and it's basically so that every chloroplast gets its chance or its shot at optimum light uh, for the, the process of photosynthesis. So you might just go back and, and kind of review those, uh, those different structures, not to memorize them, not to uh, know every last part ad nauseum, but to be familiar with overall functions and structures. Plant needs, what do they need? They need sunlight for photosynthesis. They need water for photosynthesis as well. And for, for support, plants don't have a, um, a skeleton like we do, so they've got to depend on turgor pressure, that internal support along with the cell wall, to be able to stand up straight. Um, you can think about if you get a little careless at home and you, and you walk by a plant, you can take a look at it and go, oh, I uh, forgot to water. What's your clue? It's, it's wilted. Why is it wilted? It's lost pressure, uh, and that's from, from water. So get some practical knowledge in there so that, so that kids can uh, solve some problems for themselves. Um, they also uh, uh, have a, a, a problem or a need to figure out how they're going to reproduce without water, just like all organisms as they move away from the water have to do. So those are some uh, of, of the things that plants need. When we look at the major groups, we're going to break them up into, first of all, the uh, non-vascular plants, which are the, are the bryophytes. Examples are mosses, hornworts, uh, liverworts. They do not have vascular tissue, so right away, uh, you need to have a conversation with your students about what would that mean and uh, what would it limit for this, uh, for this plant. And obviously, if they don't have the vascular tissue to transport water and minerals, then they're going to have to do it through diffusion and osmosis, and that's going to limit their overall size. Many people uh, you have the misconception that that gray, stringy stuff hanging from trees that we call Spanish moss is a moss. Not a moss at all. It's a flowering plant uh, in the same group as bromeliads. Uh, a, a true moss, and they're pretty easy to find, especially when it's kind of moist, uh, looks like really a lush green carpet, and it's an excellent organism to bring in. And again, use that, uh, that dissecting microscope with them it, because you'll spark some interest. When you get hands-on and you start bringing in samples, not only does that visual picture um, help make a con concrete connection, but it creates a lot of interest. And the next group are the vascular seedless plants. And this group uh, are ferns and horsetails. Uh, and they're, again, an easy organism to bring in, uh, to take a look at, uh, and study the structures on. The last group are the seed plants, and the, the seed was the, the last thing to evolve. Um, the seed lets plants move further from the water. It uh, lets them tolerate harsh cold, so it lets them overwinter uh, difficult conditions. Uh, sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's cold, but, so the seed was a big evolutionary advance for plants. The gymnosperms, that's the cycads, the pines, and the ginkgos, all have what we call a naked seed. It's not enclosed in a fruit like the flowering plants are. And there's many examples of these you can bring in. Uh, you can work with pine cones. I want to encourage you to look at uh, this ginkgo leaf. Uh, I don't know why, but the writers of standardized tests love this leaf, and partly because it's so recognizable um, that... Uh, a uh, semicircle uh, shape, all of the uh, vein, the venation of the leaf radiating out from the center. So, it, so to be sure and you take a look at that. I almost guarantee you will see that uh, in standardized in standardized test. The angiosperms are flowering plants, and probably most of what you're familiar with and what you look at uh, all around you. The uh, flowers produce pollen and seeds, and again, those are good things to go back and take a look at. There are so many neat activities you can do with plants. Uh, one thing I like to do is to do sort of a station lab. And it saves wear and tear on me. It saves uh, pillaging of the environment. 
So you can bring in examples and station them around the room, let kids uh, have hands-on looking and classifying uh, different kinds of leaves, looking at different kinds of flowers, perfect and in imperfect, looking through the microscope at root structures, um, examining the fibrous root system versus the tap root system, uh, looking at the spores on, on ferns. Once they uh, have found those kinds of things, you can do sort of a scavenger hunt and uh, go out in the field and, and have some conversations and have some ex exploration uh, about what they're seeing out around the schoolyard. A another neat thing to do is to uh, do sort of a, a lab called Supermarket Botany. And with that, in the, produce in the produce section, to talk about, we call that section the fruits and vegetables. But what is a vegetable? It's a good question. We know what fruits are, or at least we think they, we think we, we do. If you ask students to name, they're going to name peaches and pears, but they're probably not going to name a cucumber or a tomato, and those are fruits. Um, what, what things in the produce section are actually fruits? What things are actually seeds? And what things are actually plant parts? They might be a root, they might be a stem, they might be leaves. Uh, so you can uh, get some practical things going here as well. How are uh, plants important to humans? Well, of course, uh, they're, they're the basis of our food chain. We're not able to uh, produce uh, glucose from uh, light energy. We are dependent on plants for that. So a big food source, and of course, for uh, they're a big contributor to uh, oxygen as well, and we're pretty dependent on oxygen, if you'll stop and think about it. Medicines, um, the, uh, the, the list that goes on and on and on, but just to name a few, um, aspirin from the willow bark, a lot of cancer treatments we've uh, come up with from products from plants, and a, a number of stimulants have come from, um, uh, from plants as well. In industry, agriculture, wood products, cotton, um, you, can, you can make this list pretty much endless. Kingdom Animalia, finally, this is where um, this is where we fit in. I don't think it hurts to um, talk to kids about uh, our characteristics and that this is this is where we fit into the scheme of classification. Uh, no cell wall, heterotrophic, um, and and here's a, a chance I haven't talked about this when we've been talking about autotrophic and heterotrophic, but um, be sure and revisit the uh, the uh, energy pyramids and the trophic levels that you talked about with ecosystems earlier in the year. Uh, go back to that learning and revisit it again. There, uh, all animals are motile and able to move at some time in their life. Uh, sometimes it's just as a larval form, and sometimes it's throughout their adult life. We produce sexually. And they, they do have three distinct body layers of tissue, which are going to give rise to all of our specialized organs and systems and organ systems. Uh, that is with the, with the exception of the sponges. They have distinct body plans, again with the exception of the sponges, that are arranged around a central point or axis. And we refer to these two kinds of symmetry as radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry. Uh, I think about... Um, a, um, a, a sea urchin um, has pentaradial uh, sy symmetry. I think about um, coral polyps have radial symmetry. When I think about um, oh, a crayfish, bilateral symmetry. And of course, what do we have? Bilateral. Now let's break the animals apart and look at the invertebrate group and the vertebrate group. Um, if you ask your students to, to sit down and tell them that they have 60 seconds to write as many animal names as they can, and then you score that, you're probably going to find that most of them are going to list vertebrate animals, but they only comprise about 1% of the animal population. 99% are invertebrate animals, but yet the ones that really are showy and get our attention, unless they happen to be biting us, um, are, are the, uh, the, the vertebrate animals. Invertebrates, 99% of the animal kingdom. They lack a backbone. And uh, you can see the list of what they include. And we're going to look at each of these in just a little bit more detail um, when we get to the next slide. Vertebrates have an internal skeleton, a bone or cartilage. Uh, and you can see the group includes the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Our invertebrates. The invertebrates are so much fun uh, to get to. Uh, first of all, sponges. and uh, the the sponges, um, uh, this group of, are the periphera. 
They used to be classified as plants, and you can kind of see why because uh, from their growth pattern, but they do have a larva that swims. Uh, they don't have a cell wall, so they don't have the characteristics of plants. They're sessile as adults, which means they remain in place. And sponges uh, within their uh, jelly-like layer, they have uh, Y-shaped spicules that help them uh, to obtain their support. Some sponges, in addition to these Y-shaped spicules, have a protein material called spongin. And this is the material that most people think of when they think about sponges. Uh, it, it, so it's the, uh, the commercial product from, from sponges. Nadarians, Nadarians, uh, some examples just to get you thinking about that. Hydra, the uh, sea anemone, coral, sea fans, all of those are in the, uh, the Nadarian group. And one of the characteristics that they have is that they, many of them have stinging cells called nidocytes. And this kind of is a ball of thread that can be fired out and that has a neurotoxin on it to be able to um, kind of paralyze their prey so that they can draw that into their mouth. Two body forms in the Nadarians, the polyp, which is sort of an upright por portion with tentacles radiating around the mouth, and then the um, medusa, representative of the jellyfish, with the tentacles hanging down. It's sort of a bell shape. The worm group, it, within the worm group we have flatworms, roundworms, and the segmented worms. The flatworms, uh, platyhelminthes, uh, many of these are parasitic. We do, there is a big free living group, the planarian, and planarians are just renowned for the kinds of things that we can do with them in biology. They're a very easy organism to obtain and work with, with um, uh, the concept of regeneration. Um, and a chemotaxis uh, or phototaxis, uh, whether they are attracted towards light or towards other kinds of chemo chemicals, there's a lot of neat experiments that you can do with these organisms, and they are free living. The, um, some of the parasitic groups are the tapeworm uh, and flukes are in this group. The roundworms or, ne or the nematodes, uh, there are some of them that are, are parasitic, but the roundworms inhabit a tremendous amount um, of, of things on earth and particularly in the soil. They are the first organism, uh, as we're starting to look at specialized tissues, to have a complete mouth to anus digestive plan. And so that's a, a pretty much of a hallmark that happens with the roundworms. And finally, the annelids. Um, and of course, the most famous example that everybody thinks of with the annelids is the earthworm. But really, most of the annelids are marine worms. Uh, but the earthworm is a, is, a, is a great one to bring into the classroom, both as a dissection uh, specimen and, and while it may not seem real exciting to you to use an earthworm for that process, you can really, de uh, you can really come up with um, strong dissection techniques and skills that you want your student to develop with that organism. Plus, it's inexpensive, and everybody's budget uh, in teaching biology, you have to be very conscious of that. Um, and then from any bait store, you can get earthworms, and they make great um, organisms to do some inquiry activities. Well, we found out phylum Annelida, very good, somebody's got the phylum, so that it's segmented, um, lives in the dirt of soil, has muscles like us, uh, good for plants, uh, ability to regenerate, tubular body, uh, systems can be used for, um, uh, for study, and it goes, uh, it has an intestine. There's this thickened part of the earthworm right in the front, that indicates something Okay, now tell me how you know that's the front. Uh, <laughs> yeah, put it out. Yeah, good. Okay. I think this is the front. This is the front, and the that's because this thickened part of it that indicates. Uh, I think that's where one one set of the uh, um, the ovaries, I think, are located. Mm -hmm. uh, Do these appear to have what we would call um, a head end? Okay, so some kind of organization or, or, or coordination, all right. How do they seem to move? Well, they contract first the and then they the extend. I mean, it could be, <laughs> they could be wanting to see where they've been. You don't, <laughs> you don't necessarily... No, muscular, Muscular, right? The muscular, as you watch the muscular movement, do... Uh, 
Are y'all's moving? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, good. Um, I'm really curious, how many of you, when was the last time many of you worked with a whole organism? Um, and, and why would you think that might be? Could be the male female. <laughs> Could be, oh, okay, we have one idea that male or female, who do you think is more active? Male or female? Is it a living thing? Okay. Yeah. That's the one. Living it's thing. So living how do you define thing. what is a living thing? Uh, because it has the uh, living criteria. It's a movement. Okay. It's, it's, it's kind no, 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 no. But living thing, you go, you go thing. In, in what kind of a living thing? It's a multicellular. Yeah, ma yeah, of course. The mollusk group is an interesting group. Uh, when we think of mollusks, we think of shells. And, and most of them do have shells, but there are a few that, that don't have them. They have a, a visceral mass, they have some kind of a foot, uh, and they have a mantle that in many cases uh, secretes the shell. Uh, the first uh, group of mollusks uh, are the bivalves, and you think of clams and oysters. They're filter feeders. You have uh, the gastropods, which move have one shell, move about on a, uh, a large foot, and the land snail is a great example of that. And, and there are just some very cool labs you can do with land snails um, in, in calculating the size and, and mass and weight of the snail and the weight that it is able to, to pull behind it. Uh, and, and the students really get excited about uh, comparing how much weight they could pull versus how much a snail could pull. And you can do some pretty neat experiments with, with these as well. The uh, other group of, of the mollusks are the, the cephalopods, and this is a very intelligent group of, of mollusks. It includes the octopus, the nautilus, and um, the, the giant squid. The octopus has no shell, giant squid has an internal shell, and the nautilus has that beautiful chambered uh, shell that you see so many times on, on, on great uh, scientific specials. The octopus, all of these, all of these uh, uh, organisms in the cephalopod group have an eye that rivals ours, and they're very intelligent. Um, I, I, I've been amused at talking to, to researchers who've had octopus in different tanks, and maybe they had um, a small piece of PVC pipe that connected them uh, for water circulation. And if there's something in that other aquarium that that, that, that's, that octopus with a six-foot arm span wants, it can sometimes squeeze through a piece of PVC that's only several inches in diameter and then, very clever that they are, they go back to where they came from so that they're not caught the next morning. The arthropods. The arthropods make up about 75 percent of all of the invertebrates, so this is a huge group. They're characterized by the jointed appendages, an exoskeleton, and segmentation. Uh, we also classify them by the kinds and number of appendages that, that they have. The exoskeleton is something uh, that, that's really important to talk about because it, it is one of the, the uh, biggest adaptations that makes the arthropods so successful. And obviously they must be successful if they make up 75% of the um, uh, invertebrate kingdom. The um, exoskeleton, what it does is it gives them a tremendous amount of protection and, again, that concept of water conservation, uh, it, there, it, it protects them from water loss. But what is the downside of the of the exoskeleton? Well, they have to shed it to um, or molt in order to grow, so they're very vulnerable at that particular time. Uh, the, it also limits their overall size. Uh, our skeleton weighs about eight percent of our our body weight, and uh, uh, we have to have a lot of muscles just to drag it around. That exoskeleton is disproportionately weighs a, a tremendous amount compared to the arthropod body. And that's why you don't see arthropods as big as us, is simply uh, they, they, they don't have what it takes to be able to move around in an exoskeleton that just gets increasingly heavier and heavier. Echinoderms. And the echinoderms, example, starfish, uh, the sea urchin, sand dollars. Uh, the starfish have an extremely unique adaptation called a water vascular system. And they're able to pump water in through a series of canals uh, out to tube feet. And through these tube feet, they're able to conduct respiration. They're able to move about and feed. Uh, so this is, a, this is a key characteristic of the e echinoderms. We want to take a look at the vertebrate animals. And in a discussion of the vertebrate animals, we need to talk about chordates. And um, 
only the lancelets and, and tunicates are not vertebrates within this group, but you do need to spend some time talking about the, the three primary characteristics, or sometimes four, of chordates, um, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits, the notochord, and uh, a post-vertebral um, uh, tail or caudal, caudal vertebrae. And this is at some point or some time in their life cycle, not necessarily as an adult. Of, of the chordates that are vertebrates, and that's the, the biggest majority, uh, you can see that what our groups are. We have the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and the mammals. And the fish, uh, we, we want to take a look at these uh, progressively and see what kind of adaptations they've been accumulating and the complexity that they're amassing as, as we move through these um, different classes. The uh, fish has two-chambered heart, breathes with gills, and our, our, our basic groups, Agnatha, that's a jawless fish. Uh, example is the lamprey. They don't have paired appendages. They don't have scales. Uh, and they're parasitic. Chondrichthys, the shark skates and rays, and of course you could probably talk about sharks uh, for weeks on ends because the, the, the students love to do that, but <laughs> don't fall into that trap. You'll run out of, you'll run out of teaching time, but they are, uh, they are an area and uh, a big interest of students. They have paired appendages. They um, have an evolutionary advance of, of uh, movable jaw. Uh, unfortunately sometimes with shark attacks, and a placoid scale. And the placoid scale is different from the overlapping bony uh, scale uh, of the next group of fish. It sort of is an interlocking scale like a puzzle. And uh, even the, the teeth of shark are, are modified placoid scales. You can run your hand across um, shark skin and feel that uh, uh, little bump or little knob on the placoid scales. Osteichthys. Uh, what does oste mean? Bony, ichthys, fish. Again, take time to break these words apart. If you practice it all the time when you're talking, you'll find that students will pick up that and model that behavior. Uh, examples, um, bass, tuna, salmon. The bony fish um, have a lateral line uh, of royal pitted scales that lets them sense vibrations and movement in the water. They have a swim bladder that lets them swim at different kinds of level. So they're a little, they show some, some big advances over the, uh, the cartilaginous fish. Amphibians, when we move to amphibians, uh, amphibians go through a big metamorphosis. Uh, and they start out in the water because they're tied to the water to reproduce in. They have not yet come up with whatever unique adaptation it is to let them be freed from the water. So they have to reproduce in the water, and for the most part, their larva develops there. They the larva usually starts out with a two-chambered heart, uh, gills, and uh, is a herbivore. Uh, when they metamorphosize, they, uh, as adults, they have a three-chambered heart. They breathe with lungs, and they become a carnivore. So you have big changes in the digestive system as well. This group includes uh, a, a small group called the Sicilians, then the toads and, and frogs, and the salamanders. Reptiles. Uh, it, the reptiles n now have, have come up with a very important advance, and that's the amniote egg. And the importance of the amniote egg is that it freed them from reproduction in the water. So now with internal fertilization, they are able to enclose their embryo in sort of a self-contained little bag of water, and it can be laid on dry land. Think about all of the habitat uh, free from competition that the reptiles had to move into uh, w for this kind of or this size organism once they came up with this advance. The uh, most reptiles have a three-chambered heart, or a, 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 the, in the fourth chamber, the ventricle is partly separated, and only the crocodile group has a complete separation in the chambers of the heart, and that's that's a pretty uh, important defining characteristic within this group. We have the snakes and lizards. Uh, the tortoises uh, and turtles, and uh, we also have uh, crocodiles um, in in this uh, the group. And and again, just like the sharks, the kids really like the reptiles. And you can spend a lot of time. They have scales to prevent uh, what, uh, water loss, um, and and you can you, you can bring these in and have them in the classroom really pretty safely. But um, I, I would be careful and make sure that you're always careful that that you don't have any poisonous varieties. The birds, uh, the birds, uh, 
defining characteristic are feathers. And when you look at the feather, it is just such a special structure. It um, uh, combines a, a nice flat plane to work against the wind, but uh, it mac maximizes the bird's need to be light, and it needs to be light for flight. Everything about the bird is about flight. Uh, hollow bones, air sacs that extend down into the body cavity for cooling, uh, and for efficient respiration flow through the lungs so they have a continual flow of oxygen. Uh, and, and you can do a, a lot of really neat things with the birds, particularly uh, with examinations of the feathers. Um, most students don't realize uh, how unique they are and all the different things you can tell by looking at them. Uh, have you ever taken a look at a, a wing feather of a bird and noticed that uh, one side of the feather is more slender uh, or not quite as wide as the other side of the, of the feather is? And there can be uh, a number of adaptations for that. N number one, the, the shorter side prevent, uh, presents a little sharper leading edge against the wind. But think about it. every feather in the wing, you trim just a little bit um, of mass off of it, you've reduced the weight. So they're really a weight conscious organism. The mammals, uh, within the mammal group, the single uh, um, defining characteristic, or, or there's, there's several, but the most important, of course, would be hair. They also produce milk uh, through mammary glands uh, and nourish their, their young. Three um, kind of unusual uh, groups of mammals, of course, the monotrims, which are the egg layers, uh, duckbill plat uh, duck platypus and the spiny echidna. They don't have uh, nipples, but, but instead the milk kind of uh, oozes through a sweat gland and the young lick that milk off the fur of, of the animal. Then we have the marsupial group, which uh, uh, everybody immediately thinks of the kangaroo or the koala or um, in our case the, um, the opossum. And the young in this group are really born in an embryonic stage and they have to crawl up into the pouch of the mother and they're nourished there uh, sometimes for as long as a couple of years. So the marsupials um, have that real unique adaptation. And then the last uh, major groups of mammals are the placentals. And the placentals, of course, nourish their young through a contact with the mother's blood supply in a membrane called the placenta. On this next slide, uh, I want to... I did an activity with some option students where we were looking at a way of exploring all of this diversity. And I want to show you some little uh, excerpts from it because I think that it's something that just by listening you'll gain uh, some insight for your own purposes of review, but you might, it might spark your um, creativity in creating something like this for your own classroom. Uh, and, and we will uh, put up a lesson plan of this on the website as well. When you look at the directions um, for this particular activity before we start looking at it, as uh, the first thing that I did uh, was to place a label around the room, uh, one for each kingdom. And then on sticky notes or post-it notes, I wrote down a number of different kinds of characteristics of all the organisms, and I, I scanned some images of different organisms, so we had pictures. And I put um, you know, a sampling of, of, of those into a little Ziploc bags. I divided the students into groups. Uh, in the case of, of what you're going to see, groups of two. And their task was to open their bag, sort out um, all of the characteristics, and try to figure out what uh, organisms they were represented and what kingdoms. So it kind of made them start thinking globally about the overall characteristics and the kinds of organisms that you're finding in each of these categories. Uh, after they had everything in place, then I asked them to go around and review and uh, uh, look over their choices again, and then we discussed it as a class. And of course, if I were doing this with a high school group of kids, they would have had a guided worksheet to be filling in during our discussion just to make sure that they stayed on task. If you've got a bag, you've got to find a partner. And oh, you need this for the, the pictures, right? Most prevalent life form found in the whole biosphere. Okay. 
Okay. Like Coxie, what do you think it's associated with as far as which uh, kingdom? Okay. Dominant life form. Okay, right. And so over there, would you say, it, do you in the archaeobacteria and the eubacteria, do, you, do both of them have coccyx form? If they do, then you'd put it in the shared column. If, I don't know, what's your next best guess? Fungi? No. Think about characteristics of fungi. Is it, when you look at algae, uh, are, they, are they autotrophic or heterotrophic? Can they produce their own food or not? Okay, so they, so they can produce their own food. What about fungus? Can fungus produce their own food or do they have to obtain it from another source? From another source. From another source, okay. So does that tell you whether that's a fungus or not? It's an, oh, it's not. Plants. Oh, well, this is general. Pollen. Oh, put it on this side. It's a ball. Yeah, but we can put as so many sides will be more general. Yeah, general. So you yeah, can put general. General. But no, <laughs> kind of not, yeah. Not all of them. You're walking around and you find something you think definitely doesn't belong where it goes. You may stick it on the wall to the side, but leave it in the same area. So we're going to look at viruses. First of all, viruses, are they one of our kingdoms? No. And uh, are, are viruses, you know, do viruses exhibit all the characteristics of living organisms? No. no, they do not. They're, they're sort of out there in, in between and in, in between land. So as we take a look here, um, a characteristic, what about contains DNA or RNA? Is that a characteristic of viruses? Is, is there ever a case when we're inserting um, some sort of, is there a possibility that the virus could bring uh, and insert in any kind of beneficial genes? Possible. Yes. Possible. So it could be an agent of evolution? Or certainly with bacteria. Okay, good, good. Lots of thought. And you can see the value of how many connections that we can go from when we look at this kind of thing. And that, that's exactly what I'm looking at. Capsid, of course, is a uh, structure on the outside. And you see all of this diversity that you find within these groups. It lets you know why we can find them in hot ocean vents and why we can find them in the Arctic and why we can find them in, in inside organisms and outside organisms and uh, everywhere around. Uh, move with pseudopod cilia flagella. What do you think? Could be. Yeah. Okay. But I think it's a protist cell. Pro, okay. So do you, do, you, do you have any indi indication that bacteria move with flagella? Yeah. Yeah, we know that. So the flagella would be okay. But what about pseudopods? No. So this is. So that's gonna that's gonna put us out of this category. Um, Gram positive negative. Is that a test? Is that something that you can do with you bacteria? And what, and just saying that something's positive and negative. What does it have to do with? The staining. The staining, but ultimately the staining is telling you something else about well, the protein cell wall, I think. Protist, I noticed, and, and I think that this is really indicative and very interesting um, that as, as you guys were working, this was one of the last places that anybody began to put anything up on the wall. <laughs> and what's interesting about that particular observation is that this is probably an area where there is uh, the greatest, uh, uh, you know, you have, you have really um, unusual organisms and there's probably a lot more classification work to come in the protist. In fact, it, within this group you'll see that we have a plant-like group which are generally called algae, algae. good. And we have an animal-like group, which are generally referred to as the protozoans. And protozoan means first animal, so that tells you where that used to be classified. And then we have a fungus-like group. So you have uh, three very distinct kinds of groups within the protists, so it is a very diverse group. So when we're looking here, produces 50% of the world's oxygen, absolutely. The phytoplankton, um, that, that, uh, especially that float in the ocean. Then we've got a picture here, and I can see the confusion, but this, this, this picture, if some of you have had a chance to look at it, and I'll put these up, and I'll leave these up so you can go around and look later, but this particular picture uh, is showing different forms of sponges. And sponges, um, would you... We would put those in animalia, and of course, uh, for a while, they used to be in plants because of their, their growth. 
All right, fungus. When we're looking at the fungus, um, we've got example mold. Does everybody agree? All right. How about penicillin? Yes, of course. And uh, who who was it that dis that discovered Fleming, Fleming discovered penicillin and uh, all multicellular forms except for yeast? That's correct, yeast. And there's over 350 species of yeast. So don't think about yeast as just uh, one one kind. <laughs> A lot of interest over here in the plantae and animalia. Uh, we'll just go through here and look. Let's see. In general, big problem to overcome. Water loss, uh, reproduction, and support. Absolutely. When these organisms move out of the water, they've got to figure out some way to uh, come up through to be able to support themselves, to be able to get water, and then also to transmit their reproductive structures. So uh, that's true. Plants uh, with pollen, and that's in the general category. We're going to take that out of general, and we're going to find that plants with pollen are going to be gymnosperms and angiosperms. Okay, so we'll move it down here. I'll move that down here. Big problem to overcome. Water loss, yes, uh, but we've already got that covered. Do, do animals have uh, problems like that to overcome water loss, reproduction, and support? Do they? Yes, they migrate. Yes, absolutely. So once, for example, um, uh, an amphibian, can it reproduce without uh, water? No, can a reptile? Yeah. No. Yes. yes. Without be, without going back to a body of water, yes. And so we could say this with the with the plant, with the animals as well. That's pretty. Yeah. I, really and truly, I could have done a better job on on my description on that because to to get it to where I really wanted it, I would need to tell you that it was non that it was vascular because I was really going for. Um, ferns and horsetails, but I didn't give you a proper clue there. And that's another thing that's, that's always good to do in teaching. When you do something that's not as clear as it could be and kids are talking to you about that, listen and talk about the possibilities of that. Don't ever be afraid that you've, you've made a mistake or that, you, that you're wrong or that somebody else doesn't have something of value. Uh, there's a lot of times that you will see some of your own biases come out when you listen to what teacher, what kids are saying to you. Animals, all multicellular forms, is that an agreement? Yes. Okay. Big problem to overcome. Yes. Water loss, reproduction, and support once they move out of the water. And it, it, but even these organisms have to worry about water loss. Um, and then we get to our vertebrates, uh, fish. Have gills, good. Classified by reproduction, somebody put out on the wall. This is uh, fungus. Reptiles, ectothermic, uh, gills to lungs, uh, through metamorphosis. Reptiles, are they born with gills? That'd be amphibians, good. And reptiles, do they have scales? Yes, and I have vertebrate scales again, and this is not one of my boo-boos. There's another group up here that has scales. Besides fish. Fish have scales. Oh, I needed a third one. Uh, <laughs> birds. Birds also have scales, not only on, uh, on their legs, but feathers are actually a modified scale. So you're going to see scales both places as well. I'll put them up here. I, uh, that, that concludes this particular section of um, the review for uh, your certification exam. Uh, what we've looked at are representative organisms from all the kingdoms of life. And in any of the cases, um, obviously in such a short period of time, we can't go into a lot of detail, but m uh, my, my intent was to um, refresh your memory. And in any place that as I brought up terms, you went, oh, yes, I remember that. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. um, those kinds of moments. That's great. But in the other moments when you think, whoa, I'm really rusty on that, those are the places that you're going to want to go back and look at some of the expanded virtual talks. And then uh, don't forget about the slide library. In the slide library, all of the uh, all of the slides come complete with notes uh, that are in some cases more detailed than than what we've been uh, talking about today. Thanks.